So hello, um, my name is Mark Brevy. I'm Director of Community and Government Relations at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. And I wanna thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, the Your Health Lecture Series is a unique educational partnership between Michigan State University College of Human Medicine, Lake Superior State University, Northern Michigan University, UP Health System Marquette and Superior Health Foundation. Um, the goal of the series is to feature speakers who can present on a wide variety of topics of interest to public audiences. I'm proud to say that this series has been brought to each of our seven community campuses and the Upper Peninsula is the longest running community um, due in large part uh, to those sponsors that I, I mentioned before. And I do wanna make special mention of um, Eric Adam at uh, Northern Michigan University, who is the pre-health advisor there, and Britt Olson, who is the pre-health advisor at Lake State, uh, Lake Superior State University, and we certainly could not bring a program like this without them. Um, our speaker this evening is Dr. Keith English. He is the chair of the Department of Pediatrics and Human Development at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Uh, when Dr. English joined the college in 2013, uh, one of the first things he did as the new chair of the, the Department of Pediatrics and Human Development was to make a trip up to the Upper Peninsula uh, to give a talk very similar to this on immunizations and vaccinations for the Your Health Lecture Series at Northern Michigan University. And he rode in my little car uh, on the way back down to Grand Rapids. Uh, so, you know, unfortunately, I, I know he would very much prefer to be with you all in person tonight. Um, but we are honored to have him present on this uh, important topic virtually. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Dr. English. Thanks for being here. Mark, thanks for having me. I remember that trip very well. It was my first time in the Upper Peninsula. I flew up to Marquette and I had a chauffeur right back. So I got to see uh, Lake Superior for the first time, the northern shore of Lake Michigan for the first time. And I, uh, on, during that trip and subsequently, I've loved all of my trips to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. What a beautiful part of the world, especially today with all the fall colors. So thanks, Mark, and thanks, Nikki, for sponsoring this. I am sorry I'm not there in person. I'm also sorry I'm not in New Zealand, which is behind me on my screen here. Um, but I'm here to talk to you about a topic that's very near and dear to me. I am a pediatric infectious diseases physician. I practiced in Memphis at Le Bonheur in St. Jude for 23 years before I moved to Michigan State as the chair of pediatrics in the College of Human Medicine. And I'm still involved with vaccine related issues and advocacy for vaccines. And while I may or may not say it during my talk, only uh, the provision of clean water has made a greater impact on the health of children around the world over the years than immunizations. Immunization has been very much more important than antibiotics, for example. So I'll see if I can share my screen. Working on that. Uh, looks like it's gonna work. And let me start my slideshow. So tonight I'm gonna to talk to you about preventing respiratory illnesses by immunization. I changed my title slightly. I originally was gonna talk about flu, whooping cough, and COVID-19. I decided to talk about measles, the flu, and COVID-19. All of these are important respiratory pathogens. And the reason I picked measles is we have a vaccine against measles that pretty much protects you for your entire life, assuming you respond to that first dose. It's not that easy for influenza, as all of you know, since you have to get a flu shot every year because the virus changes. And the honest truth is we don't know what the situation will be for COVID-19. We do think we'll have a vaccine. We do think it will protect people and save a lot of lives, but we're not sure how long immunity will last and whether you'll need a booster dose or a different vaccine later in your life. So it's complicated and I'll get to that at the end of the talk. So first of all, a little history of immunizations. And I don't have any disclosures, but I would like to thank a number of my colleagues who shared slides that I'll show you tonight. Uh, my good friend, Kathy Edwards at Vanderbilt, a world expert on influenza vaccination. My good friend, Janet Gilsdorf, who retired a couple of years ago from the University of Michigan, pioneering scientist who studied Haemophilus influenza type B. 
and my colleague Gary Marshall at the University of Louisville, a world leader in dealing with issues related to vaccine hesitancy, developing strategies to help convince parents that immunizing their kids is the best thing for their kids. All right, so let's see here. All right, so here's the overview. I'll talk a little bit about immunizations and how important they've been and millions of lives that have been saved. Most of the talk will be about vaccines against respiratory pathogens. I'm not really gonna talk much about pertussis or whooping cough, mainly about measles and about the flu. And then I'll talk about COVID-19 at the end. So Edward Jenner uh, was a physician uh, who gets a lot of credit for developing and promoting the idea of immunization. And he should get credit, although it really wasn't his idea. As Francis Galton once said, in science, credit goes to the man or woman who convinces the world, not necessarily the man or woman to whom the idea first occurs. So in 1796, the slide says Jenner developed smallpox vaccine. Not exactly. Jenner did uh, promote smallpox vaccine and was responsible for it becoming widely used. Smallpox vaccine was suggested actually by farmers uh, in England, in Germany, and around the world who had noticed that during smallpox outbreaks, people that had a lot of contact with cows, like milkmaids, tended not to get smallpox. And many of these milkmaids had pox lesions on their arms from milking cows through a virus that turned out to be related to smallpox. And the cowpox uh, virus that was the basis for at least the initial attempts to develop the smallpox vaccine uh, was uh, in fact successful in preventing smallpox. So it's, it's an unusual story. Jenner deserves credit for promoting this. Pasteur, maybe the greatest scientist of all time in 1885, developed a vaccine against rabies. 1955, the year before I was born, uh, Sabin and Salk were working on polio vaccines and both of those vaccines saved millions of lives. Smallpox was eradicated from the globe in 1979. And then over the next 15 years or 11 or 12 years in this scenario, vaccines against the most important pediatric bacterial pathogen that affected children in the United States and around the world were developed, so-called Hib, Haemophilus influenza type B. I'll tell you a bit more about it in a few minutes. This vaccine eliminated the most common cause of meningitis in children in the United States. And the people that developed the vaccine that really worked won the Lasker Award in 1996. Many people who win the Lasker Award win the Nobel Prize in medicine. They've not won the Nobel Prize yet, but they might one day. And I'll explain why in a few minutes. So how do vaccines work? By the way, the word vaccine comes from the Latin or Spanish word for cow, vaca. It's back from that cowpox vaccine that Jenner developed. So a vaccination comes from vaca. Immunization is a little more direct. That means something that provides immunity against a pathogen. We can give you antibodies that help protect you against a pathogen by giving you an infusion of an immune globulin as you know, this is being tried currently with convalescent serum treatment or prevention for COVID-19. And we've been doing that for a long time. We can give you an immune globulin that's general. We can give you one that's specific for one pathogen. We might do that, for example, in, in a young infant who has not been immunized, but was exposed to a family member with measles. Or we could give you an immunoglobulin that binds to a particular toxin the most famous of these would be botulism toxin. A child that develops botulism is actually treated with an antibody that binds to that toxin and helps prevent it from binding to the, to the nerve synapses that cause botulism. But that's not a very good strategy because if we give you so-called passive immunization, it only lasts for a few weeks or a few months and then you will not be protected. So the best strategy is active immunization. That's when we give you a weakened or inactivated germ or a part of that germ in order to get your immune system to make those antibodies or T cells or other things that fight the pathogen. That's more like what happens when you've had actual infection. And the reason an immunization is better 
is we're not giving you the actual germ itself. And if we are, we're giving you a weakened form of it. That's why vaccines cause many fewer serious reactions than the germs that cause the diseases, because we give you a weakened or partial or a modified version of the pathogen. So that's how immunizations work. Let's see, okay. This is the single most important slide. I could end my talk right now and probably hopefully convince you that vaccinations have been a good thing. If you look at what happened in many important infectious diseases in the United States, and you simply compare how many cases were reported 100 years ago compared to how many cases were reported in 2006, even though our population you know, had quadrupled by that time, you'll notice that over half a million cases of measles were reported in the early 20th century. By the way, we know that the cases that were reported were not all the cases. So the years that 500,000 cases were reported, there were probably a couple of million children who had measles. In 2006, we had 55 cases. So that's a 99.9% .9 reduction. There weren't any cases of diphtheria in 2006. That's 100%. Mumps almost eliminated. Pertussis reduced by 89%, but not eliminated. That's because the vaccine against pertussis still is not as good as some of our other vaccines. And there's a separate talk sometime about how people are working to develop a better whooping cough vaccine. Smallpox eliminated from the earth, as best we know, in 1979. So no more cases of that disease. Rubella or German measles almost completely eliminated. And in fact, the only cases of German measles anymore in the United States are imported from abroad. There is no circulation of rubella in the United States. Haemophilus influenza type B, that germ that caused so many cases of meningitis and so many deaths in children when I was a pediatric resident in the 80s, pretty much eliminated 29 cases in 2006. Polio almost eliminated worldwide and tetanus greatly reduced and almost eliminated. So great progress in all of these areas. How big an impact have vaccines made? Well, at least 300 to 400 million people died from smallpox on the earth in the 20th century. Zero people die from smallpox today. So if we only had one vaccine, we would have saved at least three or 400 million lives in this next century. And it's estimated about two and a half million deaths are prevented around the world every year today from vaccine preventable diseases. Uh, the World Health Organization estimates that more than 20 million deaths from measles were prevented between 2000 and 2015. Despite all of our progress, it's still the case that something like one in six deaths of children under five around the world could be prevented if we had better access to vaccines everywhere. And so that's about a million and a half children a year who die from a disease that we could prevent had we immunized them. This is just a pie cart that, that shows the same thing from before, which is most of those deaths were in children less than five years of age. And you'll see the, the most important cause was actually measles. A third of those deaths were measles, that haemophilus influenza type B was 27% and whooping cough or pertussis, about 20%. So that's a little bit about the story of vaccines overall. Let me just spend a few words telling you about one vaccine, the one against that germ I mentioned, Haemophilus influenzae type B. And my friend Janet Gilsdorf, before she retired, won a number of prestigious awards from the work that she'd done on this germ. So I'm going to share a few of her slides. So this germ was actually described by a German physician, Dr. Pfeiffer, in 1889, he saw this germ under the microscope and he and other people thought it actually might be the cause of what we now recognize as a viral infection, influenza. He found it in the sputum and in the lungs of some people who died from the flu. And that's because this germ and other germs could cause pneumonia in someone who had the flu. It turned out it was not the cause of influenza, but it still has that name, Bacillus influenza later Haemophilus influenza, hemo is blood, phyllis means loving, and it's an organism that grows in the laboratory on a special type of blood auger. That's why it has the name Haemophilus. Well, Dr. Pfeiffer 
recognized this germ in 1889. And nine years later, two children who had meningitis caused by this germ were reported also in the German literature. Nobody knew that at the time, but it was the leading cause of, of meningitis in children. And because children had more meningitis than adults, it was really the leading cause of meningitis in the world. It was a bad disease and uh, most children who got it died. Uh, just a segue to Dr. Margaret Pittman, one of the first prominent female biology researchers in the world. Marie Curie won two Nobel Prizes, so she was pretty prominent in physics. But Dr. Pittman ran a laboratory at the Rockefeller Institute, and she was the first woman director of an NIH laboratory uh, in the year after I was born. And she discovered something important about this germ, Haemophilus influenza. It had two types. One type had what looked like a capsule surrounding it, uh, and the other types did not. And she discovered that only one of those types was the cause of these cases of meningitis, that so-called Pfeiffer bacillus there. That's Haemophilus influenza. And here's a early report from Boston showing it was the single most common cause of meningitis in children. For reasons that we understand now, this was an underestimate. It was harder to grow than those other germs. And by the time I was in training, 45, 50 years later, it was clearly more common than all the other causes of meningitis in young children put together. And Dr. Pfeiffer figured out again that one type was the type that caused it, so-called type B. Haemophilus influenza type B. So that was an important discovery that Dr. Pittman made. And then along came Dr. Fothergill and Dr. Wright in a study that my boss during my pediatric training, Ralph Feigen, thought was the most important study in the history of infectious diseases in children. Because what Dr. Fothergill and Dr. Wright discovered was that uh, there was a, a, something that already was known, which was that children with Haemophilus influenza type B only got meningitis in their first few years of life. It was most of the cases were in the first two years of life, and it was very rare after six years of age. And, and that's what you could see over here if, if, the, if it had a better uh, grid on the bottom. So almost all these cases, these are the, this is the first year of life, second year of life, very few cases after age five. Well, what they discovered was there was something in the blood of older children that would kill this germ when you put it in a test tube. And that's why they weren't getting meningitis. They didn't know what that something was. This was 1932, but they talked about the bacterial cytal power of blood. Well, it turned out that what they had discovered was an antibody and it was an antibody against the capsule that Dr. Pittman had discovered. This discovery was the key to developing a vaccine that would eventually eliminate this disease because the vaccine only worked if it would trigger the production of these antibodies against that capsule. So Dr. Pittman's discovery, the report from Dr. Father Gillen Wright, that led to eventually many years later, 50 years later, a strategy to get rid of this germ. Now, when I was training in pediatrics and I finished medical school in 1982, so I did my residency from 1982 to 1986, and then I was a fellow in infectious diseases in Seattle for another four years. During that time, this germ caused more bacterial meningitis in children than all the other germs put together, and it caused a lot of other serious diseases too. Some of them were listed here. And when I did my residency in Houston at Texas Children's Hospital, we had more than 100 children a year in, who were admitted to the hospital with serious infections, sometimes fatal, from this germ, 100 a year. That meant that every time I was on the wards at Texas Children's, we always had at least one patient who was recovering, hopefully recovering, from this terrible infection. So this common problem that I saw during my residency, pediatric residents today never see at all because of this vaccine. And why did the vaccine work? This was a cool story and I'll move on to the rest of my talk, but I have to say something about this. So it turns out the reason that young children get bad infections to, due to this germ is they cannot develop a strong immune response to that capsule 
that Dr. Pittman had discovered, for reasons that are complicated, they don't make a good immune response to that. Well, some smart basic scientists figured out a way to trick the immune system. They knew that children could develop a good uh, response to some other types of germs like diphtheria or tetanus, even when they were two months old. So they actually took those proteins from diphtheria and tetanus or the toxins and they link them to the capsule from Haemophilus and they made a so-called conjugate vaccine. Those two things were conjugated together. And lo and behold, that fooled the immune system. Children responded to that. They developed an antibody and they were protected from Haemophilus influenza. So David Smith and Porter Anderson won the Lasker Award for this. And like I said, they might still win the Nobel Prize. Here's what happened. The disease started off it went down a little bit when the, vac the first vaccine was licensed for older children. Then the conjugated vaccine came along and the disease pretty much went away. There were 30 cases in 2012. We've had one case at MSU in the seven years I've been here. And again, we used to have 100 cases a year uh, in Houston when I was in training. So this was a huge breakthrough. And we have other vaccines today based on this same strategy. All right, so I'll shift gears and I'll talk about the respiratory pathogens I promised to talk about. So the first one, maybe the most important is measles. So measles is a terrible disease that has already told you, the WHO suggests that at least 20 million lives were saved from vaccines that prevented measles in 15 years. Measles is a dramatic infection. It's not missed very often, uh, but it's not trivial. It's very contagious. It's probably the most contagious disease known to man. If you've read about the COVID-19 outbreak and the virus that causes it, you've read about something that's called this R0 number. That's basically an estimate of how many other people are gonna get infected if you have this disease. And for measles, that might be as high as 18. In other words, one person gets measles, 18 more people get infected. Well, you don't have to do the math uh, to figure out that pretty soon you have an outbreak. And that's why we had measles outbreaks in uh, New York City and Detroit in the last couple of years. It's so contagious. And to make it worse, it's contagious before people get a rash. So they don't know they have measles and they're already spreading it. It's much worse than COVID in terms of the contagiousness. A doctor in Scotland, uh, back in 1750 showed that measles was caused by something that was in patient's blood. And of course we know now that's a virus. Uh, it's the measles virus, so it's a paramyxovirus. Enders and Peebles first isolated in 1954. Dr. Enders later won the Nobel Prize for also isolating the polio virus. Measles is a respiratory virus. Even though it causes a rash, it's spread by the respiratory route. Most of the symptoms are respiratory and it multiplies and lives in the respiratory tract. It gets into your bloodstream, that's how you get a rash from it, but it starts in the respiratory tract. It, takes, it has a longer incubation period than COVID or the flu. It's usually about 10 to 12 days. And classically, you get fever and the three Cs. You get a cough, you get coryza, that's just medical speak for a runny nose, and you get red eyes or conjunctivitis. And you may have a rash inside of your mouth. That's what an ananthem is. These coplic spots are little white bumps inside your mouth. If you see those, it's pretty typical for measles. Uh, the rash of measles is so famous, we call other rashes that look like it morbilliform. Morbilla is the Latin name for the measles virus. So like if you get a rash because you had a reaction to an antibiotic, and it's a splotchy rash all over your body, you say, oh, that's a morbilliform rash. The rash starts uh, two or four days after people have symptoms. It starts on your face or the head. It often starts behind your ears. It spreads down the trunk, and then it spreads into the middle. That's what centripetally means. And then it becomes confluent. You're just red all over. It lasts five or six days, and it goes away. And the classic measles rash looks like this and you've got those red eyes, and it's, it's a very impressive rash. You're not likely to miss it. Uh, and children with measles do not feel well. 
I'm still mad that the Brady Bunch had an episode of the, uh, you know, 20, 40 years ago, showing all the Brady kids at home having a great time because they were so happy they had the measles and didn't have to go to school. People with measles are not happy. They don't feel well and they get complications like ear infections, pneumonia, diarrhea, and about one in a thousand get brain inflammation. Uh, and about one in, you know, one to three in a thousand can die, even in the United States, even with good medical care. Measles is a bad disease. Uh, Gary uh, Marshall shared these data with me during a recent flu outbreak, a measles outbreak in the United States, 18% of kids were hospitalized. And uh, what's that? One in 500 died. So it's not a trivial disease. I already said that we had more than half a million cases a year in the United States before we had a vaccine. And back in 1956, the year I was born, about 450 people in the United States died from the measles that year. Again, worse in young infants. And around the world, it was about two and a half million people a year who died of the measles. And it's much worse in countries where there's more malnutrition, vitamin deficiencies and underlying disease. So it's much worse in some parts of the world than it is in the United States. Thank goodness we have a very good vaccine. Measles vaccine is one of the best vaccines we've ever had. Started licensed in 63, uh, developed as measles, mumps and rubella in 1971. That's the only one in the United States. We give two doses because one dose protects about 95% of people 98 to 99 percent are protected with two doses and once you're protected you're protected for life almost always and so it's one of the best vaccines ever developed it's much more effective say than our flu vaccine it's also very safe it's been around for 56 now 57 years it does cause some mild side effects like fever and rash there are some more severe side effects although they're self-limited that are rare, like one in 3,000 or 4,000 children could have a febrile seizure, or one in 20 to 40,000 could get a low platelet count. Those are those resolved though. Very rarely there can be serious side effects, particularly if an immunocompromised child got measles, it is a weakened live vaccine, so we don't give it to a child that has an immune deficiency, but it's not associated with encephalitis in other children, and it's not associated with autism. I have another lecture I can give sometime about the fraudulent reports from Andrew Wakefield and his attempts to prove that measles vaccine caused autism. It doesn't, we know that. Here's what happened with measles, Boy, I love this chart. Here are the seven or 800,000 cases a year being reported. I mentioned way back at the turn of the century, they're half a million. By the 50s and 60s, it was seven or 800,000 cases a year. And then it just fell off this cliff. Even in outbreak years, uh, like in the 1989 to 90 season, in the recent years, we have a few hundred cases, you know, not nothing like we had uh, then. So measles vaccine is fabulous vaccine. One of the best vaccines we've ever had. All right, this reminds me to shift gear to a disease where we have a good vaccine, but a vaccine that varies every year about how good it is. It's not perfect and we need a better vaccine and that's the flu. What do we know about the flu? Well, there's two main types of the flu that infect people, influenza A and B. And most years, both influenza A and B strains circulate around and cause disease. There are some differences that are not important for today's talk. Uh, they both have a similar structure and that they have two proteins on their outside that help them cause disease and that help you uh, not get the flu if you have an antibody that reacts to them. That's the so-called hemagglutinin and, and the neuraminidase. So influenza A has certain subtypes. Influenza B doesn't have those, but has a similar structure. And so every year today, every year now, the annual flu vaccine has either three or usually four now strains in it. Two different influenza A's might be circulating and two different influenza Bs. So this year's quadrivalent vaccine, which I got last week and I encourage all of you to get if you haven't had it yet, has two, has two different A's and two different Bs. Influenza-like illness, everybody knows what that is, right? Because you've all had it. Uh, it's a respiratory illness with cough and sore throat and fever, but you also have those aches and pains, the myalgias and arthralgias that 
accompany the flu that you don't tend to see with most of the respiratory viruses. Unfortunately, flu can present with severe problems that can be life-threatening like pneumonia uh, and can have side effects that involve the brain or the heart uh, or the muscle. Um, and in young children, the flu is, may just cause a febrile illness in an irritable child. It may not be obvious that it's the flu. If you're six or eight or 40 years old and you get the flu, you have a constellation of symptoms that usually makes it pretty easy to say, oh, that's probably the flu. Not so easy this year because COVID-19, unfortunately, uh, overlaps too much with the flu. But most years during flu season, if you have flu-like symptoms, you have the flu. How many people get the flu every year in the United States? Estimates are uh, last year, it was somewhere between 39 and 56 million people. And something like half a million people were hospitalized. And the number of deaths, I'm picking the middle number here, was probably in the 40,000 range. Kids are the most likely to be infected and the most likely to spread flu every year. We don't know why it's not the case for SARS-CoV-2, the cause of COVID-19. Kids can spread it, but they seem to be less important than young adults, for example, in spreading COVID-19. We don't know why. But while kids mainly spread the virus, they're not the ones that get the most severe disease. That's much more likely in the elderly, although very young children are at risk and pregnant women are at risk. So kids are more of the folks who spread it to everybody else. And every year we get a curve of the flu in the United States that looks something like this. It shows up, these numbers here are the week of the year. So there's week 40, week 42. Here's week 52. Obviously, here's the end of the year. So every year in the United States, depending what state you live in, flu shows up usually in November, gets higher, goes up, drops down a little bit over the Christmas holidays because kids are not in school, and then goes back up and peaks in January, February, then goes away. So the flu is predictable in causing an epidemic every year in a pandemic sometimes like it did in 2009. Not many children die from the flu, but every year, and here are four years, 110 to 186, 188. So one to 200 children a year in the United States in most seasons die from the flu. So that's a low rate of mortality, but that's still a couple of hundred children uh, that we, you know, that we wish we could have prevented the flu. By the way, most of these children were not immunized. There are some kids who are immunized every year who die from the flu, but they're much less likely to die, as I'll show you in a, in a slide in a minute. So what's good about the flu and what's bad about the flu? Well, the bad part is flu mutates a lot. It changes. New flu strains are out there. That's why we have to give a new vaccine every year. Uh, the, at least in young children, the, it may simply be a fever and irritability, and so it's hard to know. In older children, it's easier to say, oh, this is probably the flu. And here's a real problem with the flu. Even though we really know a lot about it, we have to monitor flu activity around the world in Asia and the Southern Hemisphere, figure out what is likely to be circulating in the United States, decide what to put in the vaccine, and then it takes months to make the vaccine. We usually, most vaccines are grown in eggs and it takes a long time to do it. And so we finally get the vaccine and it's ready and we give it for that season. And then we have to go back to the drawing board to figure out what vaccine to give next year. So we need a better vaccine. However, the vaccine we have saves tens of thousands of lives every year in the United States and possibly more in many cases. And as of current recommendations, this is last year, but the, the new ones for this year are the same. Everyone in the United States should get vaccinated against the flu every year if they're six months of age or older, unless they have a rare contraindication. You might be thinking, well, why not give the flu vaccine to two month olds and four month olds? And we might do that one day, but as of right now, there's not enough data to recommend giving it routinely to them. That's one of the reasons why if you have a two month old or a three month old in your home, it's particularly important that the older children and the adults get the flu vaccine because otherwise that young infant could be susceptible if somebody else in the house gets the flu. So does flu vaccine work? And the answer is yes. Is it perfect? The answer is no. 
Does flu vaccine always prevent the flu? No. Here's the recent, some recent data. So in the 2019-20 year, overall, people that got the vaccine were about 50%, 45% on average, less likely to develop the flu. Notice it was a little bit better in kids six months to 17 years and a little bit worse in young adults. Uh, so in the range of 25 to 55%. So overall, about 45% of uh, people, you know, you were 45% less likely to get the flu. That's still pretty good. And maybe more importantly, if you look at the likelihood that you would get very sick with the flu and wind up in the hospital, that was better. That was 57% and 75% for flu, for, I'm sorry, for kids. Making an important point, the flu vaccine is one of many vaccines that prevents infection completely in some cases, but even when it doesn't prevent infection, on average, the person that gets infected after having had the flu vaccine is less likely to be severely ill than the person that didn't have the flu vaccine. We're hoping the same thing's true for SARS, by the way. We'd love to have a vaccine that prevented infection totally, but even if it prevents some of the infection and makes the other infections less severe, that would of course be a win. So this is sort of standard for the flu. The, the, the efficacy varies year to year. Some years it's not as good as others, but it always prevents a, a number of cases and saves lives. And it's always better at preventing severe disease than it is at preventing all disease. And that's what we really want in a vaccine. And despite that, uh, only about half the people that should be getting the flu shot are getting the flu shot. Here's data from kids in the blue line, 59% in 2016, and adults, 43%. No reason for more people not to get their flu shot. And this year, with COVID circulating and the possibility, we don't know this, but that COVID and the flu together might be worse than COVID alone, please get your flu shots. Having said all that, we're not happy with the flu vaccines we have today. We want a vaccine that would protect you forever like measles vaccine. Wouldn't it be nice if we could give you a flu shot this year and tell you, don't worry about it, you don't need a flu shot again. So we need a universal flu vaccine and a bunch of different strategies are being used to try to develop one, but we're not there yet. So the flu is common. Flu vaccines are safe and effective. Uh, some years they're better than other years. Usually, though, they prevent more severe disease and they prevent total disease, and we're working on new flu shots. So get your flu shot. You know what this is. You've seen this on national television, I think. You've seen it uh, in the media and in the newspaper. This is a coronavirus. Corona is a crown. Those are the crowns on the surface of the coronavirus. So back in the late part of last year, and then in the United States in the early part of this year, patients were recognized with pneumonia and other respiratory symptoms from a novel coronavirus that had never been recognized before. We had seen other coronaviruses. In fact, there are some coronaviruses that are not on this slide that cause the common cold and don't make anybody very sick. And, circulate every year in the United States and around the world. We don't worry about them much because they're just cold viruses. But back in 2002, we had the outbreak of this severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS, uh, which was caused by a novel coronavirus. And luckily it never spread worldwide. It caused about 8,000 cases and about 10% of those people died. There were cases in Asia and then in North America, particularly in Toronto. Uh, it looks like that virus probably came from bats and other wild animals and then spread to humans. And fortunately, it never developed into a worldwide pandemic because it was bad, 10% death rate. Uh, it went away. We don't really know why, we're happy. A lot of efforts were made to help keep it from spreading, but if it had been as contagious as SARS-CoV-2, we would have had a worldwide pandemic. In 2012, another coronavirus was recognized, uh, so-called MERS uh, coronavirus, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. 
This caused fewer cases than SARS had caused, but it was more severe. 2,500 cases and about a third mortality. So it was particularly bad, very dangerous, thought to have come from bats and camels to infect people. And fortunately, again, never became a worldwide pandemic. And then along, of course, in late 2019, early this year, by the way, this slide's about a month old, so it's behind. We've had over 215,000 deaths in the United States now. You know, I think there have been probably more than 20 million cases globally. This virus probably came from bats. Uh, the mortality rate's not 10 or 35 percent. It's probably more like 1 percent. But once you have millions of people infected, that's still a lot of people who died from this virus. And I like these slides. I borrowed the next three slides from my friend Kathy Edwards at Vanderbilt because I want to talk about immunity to a virus. Obviously, one way you can become immune to a virus is to have the virus and get over it and then have immunity. I had chickenpox as a kid because there was no chickenpox vaccine. And so if you get chickenpox and you do well, which most people do, you're usually immune for life. The problem is some people with chickenpox get life-threatening complications and die from it. So that's not a very good strategy, even for a virus with a very low mortality rate. You're better off if you have a vaccine. Other viruses like the flu, if you get the flu, you probably won't get the flu again this year, but you might get it next year because the virus changes. So it's much better to get a vaccine that will not make you sick and then will give you the ability to fight off the infection when you see it. So that's the whole point of a vaccine. You've heard a lot in the news, it's in the news this week about so-called herd or community immunity. Most of us infectious diseases don't like the term herd immunity because we don't like to think of our patients and people as part of our herd. So community immunity is probably better. The idea though is that a certain percentage of the population needs to be immune to something to keep it from spreading you know, through the community. Measles is the most contagious infectious disease we know. We need you know, 85, 90% of the population immune to measles or else measles can spread if it's introduced in the community. SARS-CoV-2 is not that contagious, but it's contagious enough that most experts say, well, if you're going to prevent it from spreading the community, you still probably need 60 to 75 percent of people to be uh, immune to it. We don't even know how much immunity you get from having infection yet. And of course, vaccines are still being tested. Uh, so we're nowhere near where you would have herd immunity today. And the people that have said as, as recently as this week, well, just let everybody get infected and get herd immunity. That's a really terrible strategy. Number one, there, if you allow more and more people to get infected, even low risk people, they're more likely to spread it to high risk people like people in nursing homes, people with immune deficiency, et cetera. And the case fatality rate for this infection is just too high. So Kathy is in at Vanderbilt, so she made this calculation that if you 70% of people in Tennessee were infected with COVID-19 in order to have herd immunity, we'd have about 50,000 people who would die from that. That's not an acceptable strategy. So we need to keep doing those things which are not any fun, but like social distancing, wearing a mask, washing our hands until we get a vaccine. And when we get a vaccine, then of course, our goal is to immunize enough people that we get community immunity. So how about a COVID-19 vaccine? Dr. Edwards, by the way, just gave a really great uh, grand rounds for MSU about uh, two months ago on developing a COVID-19 vaccine. I'm gonna show you a couple of slides I borrowed from her last week. She's updated that talk about 20 times since then. So she gave me some updated slides just this week. So the good news about a COVID-19 vaccine is it should work. We know about other coronaviruses People did study the possibility of developing a vaccine for SARS and for MERS, and they never needed it because those diseases went away. But they learned things about the virus, how it was structured, what kind of immune response would probably work. So it's good. And we know there's one protein on the surface of these coronaviruses, that spike protein, that plays an important role. And there's a lot of evidence that a good immune response against that spike protein is probably protective. So that's the good news. The bad news is 
immunity to the circulating coronaviruses that cause a cold, if you get one of those viruses, it looks like you're immune this year, but after a few months or a year or two, you're susceptible again. So the bad news might be that we might get a vaccine that works, but we might have to keep giving it to you every year or two. You know, and if, if that's the case, that'll be a problem. So we think we'll have a vaccine, not by election day, but maybe by next year, but we're worried, we don't know yet, how effective will it be? We're pretty sure though, that it makes sense to target this spike protein. There it is. Corona, as I mentioned, is a crown or a circle. Here's that spike protein I showed you in the cartoon on the surface of the coronavirus. It binds to cells and gets in. So we know that it makes sense to target that spike protein. And, you know, people already knew about similar proteins and other coronaviruses. So as soon as this virus was discovered, people were figuring out how that protein is structured, how it works, and working on ways to develop immunity against it. So from the get-go, people have targeted this. And an important lesson that had been learned from SARS, and actually is true for other viruses too, my friend John DiVincenzo in Memphis, who studies respiratory syncytial virus, the most common serious viral infection in young infants, uh, there's a similar situation. This spike protein and a protein on the surface of RSV, which looks different from this, both of them change their structure once they bind to the cell. And a lot of the work to develop a vaccine against RSV in the early years was using a purified protein that its structure had already changed. And it turns out making an antibody against that doesn't help you at all. You have to bind to the protein before it binds to the cell. And so people have discovered now that this so-called pre-fusion form of the protein for RSV and for coronaviruses is the right form. You've got to have, if that's gonna be the antigen in your vaccine, it's gotta be in the right confirmation or it won't work. But the good news is people knew that, they figured that out, they've tested that, they've been testing it in animals, et cetera. So it looks like if you use the right form of this protein, it will trigger a good immune response and is likely to be a good vaccine. All the evidence suggests it's the right strategy. Uh, there are so many different companies working on so many different types of vaccines for this. The problem is that's gonna be figuring out which one works best because it's likely that a bunch of these will work. You can use an inactivated version of the virus. You can use a different virus to show some of the proteins from this virus. You can use these RNA or DNA vaccines that you've heard about in the literature that I'll mention in a minute. You can use protein vaccines that have that spike protein in them. All of these different strategies uh, probably will work uh, and will probably develop an immune response. Which one will be better? We don't know. And the tricky part will be, it's likely that by early next year, there'll be enough evidence to show that several of these might work and it's gonna be hard to figure out, okay, which ones are we gonna use? It may depend more on how could we make a lot of this vaccine than which one is the best? Because if vaccine X is the best vaccine, but it would only be possible to make a few hundred thousand doses of that, and vaccine Y is almost as good, but you could make a hundred million doses of it, well, you would choose vaccine Y. I'm not gonna go through this slide, but it's the old slide, the slide of how it usually works to develop a vaccine. It takes years and years and years. You have to test it in the test tube and in animals. You have to test it in humans to show that it's safe. Then you test it in humans to show that you get an immune response. And then you do a big study in humans to show that people to get the vaccine really are less likely to get the disease. That's the phase three trial. That's what you really want. And it takes a while to do all that. So as you know, Operation Warp Speed and other things are trying to speed that up. And that's okay, as long as the safety concerns are there, as long as enough people receive the vaccine to determine whether it's safe and effective, but it's not trivial to do this, it's difficult. So last slide, actually, it's maybe the almost last of my slides, I saw I'd show you an update that actually came to me in the mail today. So I got the New England Journal of Medicine. I subscribed to it. It's the world's most important medical journal. I got this article today 
from Corbett and Barney Graham and colleagues at the NIH who've been testing one of the most promising vaccines. It's a vaccine where you actually inject the RNA that then causes the spike protein to be made <clears throat> uh, into people. And this vaccine has already been shown in some promising early studies to be safe in people. It's in efficacy trials right now in people. But of course, it would be um, a problem, although it's actually been considered, uh, it's tricky to decide whether it would ever be ethical to give a human being a vaccine and then challenge them with the germ to see if it works. You could do that for a mild illness, but if it's an illness that might be life threatening, obviously, I don't know if you would sign up for that trial or not. So these studies done in non-human primates, which do develop disease, from this virus, what Barney Graham and his colleagues shown just this week at the NIH is this vaccine induced great antibody levels uh, that were higher than those you see in people who are recovering from the viral infection. It got the right type of immune response, this so-called T helper type one response, which is what we want. Uh, seven of eight animals, you couldn't find the virus at all in their lungs. One of them, they found a small amount. They didn't find it in the nose of any of the animals, and it didn't cause any inflammation in the lungs. So the bottom line was this vaccine, they could give it to non-human primates, and then they could challenge them with the vaccine, which would, with the wild-type virus that would infect them, and it protected them. So this type of data is actually much stronger than data where you just look to see if there's an immune response. So this is all, this article and others like it are very encouraging. They all suggest the vaccine probably will work, probably will protect people against this virus, but there'll still be all the questions about, okay, how long will that last? Will you need a booster dose? What will happen down the road? But it's very encouraging. So a lot of good people have worked really hard and I think it's gonna work. I think, that Mark and Nikki, that's my last slide. I've only got more slides of New Zealand after that. So I'll stop. I'm happy to answer questions uh, from anybody in the audience. I don't know if you have a chat. Yeah, so I'll read some of the questions to you. Dr. Okay. Thanks for your presentation. That was wonderful, especially this latest news that gives us some hope. Um, one of the questions that I just received from email is, is there any hope of a combined 11 year old vaccine like at least the Tdap with MCV, uh, a number of injections does matter, especially now with the addition of the flu. No, it's a good question. What'll have to happen is if a vaccine like this gets licensed, then there'll have to be more studies combining it with other things. The problem with combination vaccines is that the way the approval process goes, and it's because of safety, and I understand it, is even if you've shown that three different vaccines work great, you still have to do another study to show that they still work well when you combine them. It's a good point. There are a lot of vaccines that kids get. It is a lot of visits to the doctor. And that's why having a flu shot that you could give once would be great. You wouldn't have to get that every year. Wouldn't that be nice? Most of the uh, injections for kids are in those first two or three years of life where you really have a critical time to develop the immunity against some of these pathogens. So the answer is we don't know, but at first, any of these vaccines will have to be approved first alone, and then they'll have to be studied in combination before they will be approved in combination. I do see one question about the messenger RNA vaccine. Could it bind to human DNA? It shouldn't. Uh, it shouldn't. Um, because these messenger RNAs are viral specific. And one of the problems is um, that um, if our immune system's working well, it would degrade these RNAs and you would never, they're never able to do what they're trying to do, which is make these viral proteins. No, we don't think they'll bind to, to human DNA. There is a good question in there about why MERS and SARS went away. I sure wish we knew why. Um, we don't know why Ebola went away for many years and then came back. Uh, it's believed to be related to fluctuations in the animal reservoir, but that's not really a good answer because, you know, why is that? I mean, why did we get MERS in the first place? Nobody knows that. I mean, here's a virus, you know, that had been present in animals for a long time. 
Why did it jump to humans? Why did that happen? Did the virus change? Um, we don't really even know why did you know why didn't MERS and SARS spread more widely? Thank God they were not more contagious than they were, uh, but we don't know. And I don't I don't even think there I don't even think there are any even any good ideas about why it happened. You know, one of the questions is uh, another question is are is this virus, SARS-CoV-2, is it related to those circulating cold viruses? And is that why kids don't get severe disease? A lot of people thought that would be true back in February, but it doesn't look to be true. The immune response doesn't seem to be cross-reactive, even though there are some people that have naturally occurring immunity that seems to protect them somewhat from this virus. It doesn't seem to be from exposure to other uh, coronaviruses. Here's a good question. Are there co comorbidities for adults with greater uh, risk of COVID are discussed? Are there known comorbidities for children with the inflammatory issues with COVID? So very good question. The bottom line appears to be that children, while they usually do not get severe disease, can get severe COVID, life-threatening acute COVID now I'm talking about. And that does appear to be more common in children that have an underlying problem, whether it's obesity, neurologic problem, immune deficiency, et cetera. However, most of the children that get this post-infectious multi-inflammatory syndrome with COVID uh, do not appear to have an underlying immune problem or other problem and are otherwise healthy as best we can tell. However, my opinion is they all probably have some small genetic difference that puts them at risk, more likely. So we don't know that yet, but they do not appear to be the same group that's at risk for more severe acute COVID. And that's interesting. Why, oh, here's a good question. Why are some people asymptomatic to certain viruses and other people get symptoms? Yeah, even if they've been vaccinated for other diseases. That's the million dollar question. There's been a lot of, uh, of uh, interest for good reason in the literature and in the lay literature about why is it that some people with COVID or asymptomatic never get sick at all? There's some famous examples now where, you know, one person in the family got it and got a cold and the sister got it and died. Uh, on the other hand, there are also a few examples of where two brothers got overwhelming COVID and both died or one died and one was critically ill, even though they were young people with no known risk factor. Well, it turns out that in a few cases, uh, scientists have discovered specific genetic mutations that put these people at risk for severe COVID. But you know what? The same thing's true for the flu every year. I showed you hundred, you know, all those kids get the flu every year and a hundred uh, to 200 die. A few of those that die had some underlying problem. Most of them did not. When we had the 2009 flu pandemic in Memphis, the first patient who died was a, an athlete, uh, you know, a really good football player in great physical condition. And yet he got the flu and got pneumonia and died. And I suspect that he had some small difference in his immune response that put him at risk. The same thing's true for all infectious diseases. It's, it may not be any more true for COVID than for anything else. There's just variability between people that's probably explained by small genetic differences between us. That's probably why one person gets chickenpox and gets sick, but you know recovers fine, and then somebody else gets chickenpox and develops a life-threatening complication. There's probably small differences between those people genetically probably not differences in the virus. As a matter of fact, most of the work so far on COVID does not suggest that any kind of mutation in the virus is responsible for somebody getting a lot sicker than somebody else. It's probably differences in the people, differences in the host. Good questions. There's an article in the New England Journal this week about so-called genome-wide association studies trying to figure out why it is some people with COVID get so sick. And they found a couple of spots that were related to the immune system again that will be investigated more. And that might explain why some people get it, but we're nowhere near understanding why it is that most people get it. We know if you're older, it's bad. 
We know obesity is a risk factor. We know underlying heart or lung disease is not good, uh, but we don't really understand why most otherwise healthy people get life-threatening infection from this. We don't know. Any other questions? It doesn't look like we have any other questions. And it one is more. 30. Oh, maybe one more. One more. Last question. Why do we see so many different strains of the flu, but only a few? It's a good question. So influenza, uh, we know a lot about influenza and how it has something that we call antigenic shift or antigenic drift. All influenza strains mutate. And so they may have drift in the antigen, which means it changes a little bit over time. Only influenza A has what we call antigenic shift. That means it switches from a totally different hemagglutinin or neuraminidase to a different one. That's why in 2009, H1N1 flu was such a big deal because it was different. That's why the 1918 Spanish flu killed so many people. It was a new H and N. Whereas that doesn't happen with influenza B, only influenza A. COVID hasn't changed that much yet. Most viruses don't mutate the way that flu does, although other viruses like HIV mutate so much that that's a problem for the immune system. That's one of the reasons we don't have a vaccine for HIV yet is it mutates too much. So yeah, every virus is different. It's a good question. And we don't understand all that yet uh, for SARS-CoV-2. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks, Mark. And thanks to all of you for attending. Yes, thank you. Um, and look forward to the YouTube video if you would like to revisit anything that Dr. English spoke about tonight. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.